There, there we go. That was my fault. I muted everyone. I muted myself. Um, so uh, General Weirich uh, helped create the multi-agency GAN unit, which was the uh, first federal and state law local enforcement organization designed to curb gang activity. In 2011, this unit imposed the state's first anti-gag injunction in the Riverside neighborhood of Memphis. As district attorney, General Weirich has not only pushed for harsher punishment for violent offenders, but has also embraced innovative ways to prevent crime. General Weirich offers office sponsors the annual Do the Right, W-R-I-T-E, Thing Anti-Violence Essay Contest for Students, runs the Truancy Reduction Mentoring Program, and created Lives Worth Saving, a prostitution diversion program with Calvary Episcopal Church and nonprofit organizations. Hundreds of students with perfect attendance have received free bicycles in a partnership that includes the DA's office, the Hyde Family Foundation, and the Memphis Police Department. And General Weirich serves on numerous boards and commissions, including the Family Safety Center, the Memphis Shelby Crime Commission, the Memphis Child Advocacy Center, and the YMCA, uh, among others. On General Weirich's watch, the DA's office has been listed among the top 50 workplaces in Shelby County by the Commercial Appeal. She's a graduate of Germantown High School, earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Tennessee at Martin, and a law degree from the Cecil C. Humphrey School of Law at the University of Memphis. And General Weirich and her husband Chuck have four children and are members of the St. Louis Catholic Church. Um, before turning it over to General Weirich, today's format will be, um, if, if you, uh, we're going to just let her speak, there's not going to be a PowerPoint, it's going to be open discussion as if we were sitting in the room together. If you have a question, you can just raise your hand or unmute yourself or, you know, interrupt at a, an appropriate time, we can take the question there, or we can wait um, until the end, um, and she'll, she'll take questions then. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to General Weirich. Thank you. Well, it's great to be with you all this morning, even if it is in this new format that we're all still getting used to. As you heard uh, from my introduction, and thank you, Henry, for that and for all of the arrangements made to make this possible, it's great to see so many familiar faces on the screen. Of course, I've got to give a shout out to my predecessor and one of my mentors, Bill Gibbons, and his wonderful family who are on the screen, and then Rob Steele, who's one of our assistant district attorneys here in the DA's office and is on the front lines every day um, fighting for victims and doing justice on behalf of all citizens of the county. So it's great to see all of you. Last year, our office moved. Within the building, we went from the third floor to the 11th floor. And after close to 40 years on the third floor, you can imagine the amount of crap that we had to get rid of to make the move. And in the process of cleaning out my own office, I came upon a letter. And it was a letter that I had saved from an inmate, which was odd because most inmate mail that I get is not very nice. Uh, it has a lot of ugly words in it. Sometimes it has threats. But this particular letter I had saved and I unfolded it and took a break from my packing to read it and refresh my memory as to why I had saved it. And it was a letter from an inmate congratulating me on becoming the district attorney, on thanking me for my service to the public, which is, again, not something most inmates do. But he ended the letter with a sentence that I thought was profound. And he said that there are two types of criminals in the world and that I should always remember that. There are those who embrace antisocial behavior and there are those who struggle with it. I don't know if those words are unique to him. I don't know if he stole them from someone, but I've been a prosecutor since 1991 and it was one of the most succinct and powerful and profound ways of describing what we do every day in your DA's office on behalf of victims, on behalf of the entire community. And I wanna talk a little bit about what that looks like in a regular day here at 201 pre-COVID-19. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been doing since COVID-19. And then I'll wrap it up with my thoughts on what criminal justice reform means to me, what I think should always be a part of that conversation anytime we're talking about 
making improvements, making changes in the system. So if you were, how many of you guys, and I won't ask why, how many of you have been to 201 Poplar? Show of hands, all right. Fair, fair amount of you have been down here and seen what can from time to time be a chaotic environment. We are responsible in your Shelby County DA's office for handling every violation of state crime that occurs in Shelby County. That's everything from public intoxication to capital murder and everything in between. We have a staff of about 220 plus or minus to perform that duty every day. We handle hundreds of thousands of cases. Um, some of them are cases that come in on one day and they're gone that day. And some of them are cases that stick around and are on the dockets and in the system for years. We have a variety of different units within the office. One of the things that we had implemented a year ago was a complete restructure of your DA's office. My predecessor, Bill Gibbons, had built within the office vertical teams of prosecutors to handle certain types of crimes. And we still have those teams. But what we didn't have was that vertical approach for every crime that came into the office. So it was not beyond the realm of possibility that a victim of a crime could have two, three, four different prosecutors on his or her case before the case was completed. The way the system was built within our office a year ago was really two different criminal justice systems. There was the general sessions, the lower level, and then a case would start all over again in the criminal courts. And it wasn't the most efficient model and it wasn't the best model for the victims or those charged with the crime. So we turned the apple cart on its head and completely redesigned our office into vertical teams. And now when any case is made, when any arrest is made, the prosecutor that reviews that case tomorrow morning when they get to work here, and it may be one of Rob's cases, it's gonna be Rob's case until it's completely over in the criminal justice system. And that's important because it's going to reduce the amount of time that cases sit on the docket which is important for those charged, it's important for those victims. It's also already proven to help us rid the dockets of cases that we don't need to be wasting our time with, all right? An example of that is a policy that we put in place back in September of 2018. We implemented a policy where we no longer prosecute driving on revoked cases if the reason for revocation is strictly financial. Before September 2018, this office was burdened by tens of thousands of driving on revoked cases, day in and day out, every year. And many of those, the reason for the revocation was strictly financial. An individual might have been the safest driver on the streets, but because they owed child support, their driver's license had been revoked by the Department of Safety. All we want is for people to have a valid license if they're going to drive on the streets, but that's much easier said than done for many of the citizens in our community. And we struggled for years with a way to come up with a system that would allow us to encourage and entice and motivate drivers to get a valid license, but eventually had to just take matters into our own hands and do what was best for our office and do what was best we thought for those charged with those crimes. So we no longer prosecute those cases. What does that mean? That means that we have already eliminated over 30,000 cases from the General Sessions dockets in Shelby County by a mere power of the pen. And what that also means for prosecutors like Rob Steele and the other 120 plus that work in this office is they can focus on what matters. They can focus on those crimes that impact public safety. And by that, I mean violent crime. And we have far too much violent crime in our community. We are unfortunately one of the most violent states in the nation. And unfortunately, it is the violent crime rate in Memphis and Shelby County that contributes greatly to that list and our position rather on that list. So we'd implemented that driving on revoked policy and that had helped tremendously to clear the docket of those cases and to not make the financial burden any greater on those drivers. Nothing that we're doing within the system is going to add to the amount of money that they owe. 
Um, to contrast that with a case or a charge that gets a lot of talk is simple possession of marijuana, right? There are a lot of DAs around the nation. The DA in Nashville just recently announced a policy that he was no longer going to prosecute unlawful possession of a controlled substance um, less than half an ounce. To give you an idea of how few of those cases we see in a year, um, I had some of our data people run some numbers. And in the calendar year of 2019, we took in 459, that's about one a day, of unlawful possession of a controlled substance less than half an ounce. As compared to the tens of thousands of driving on revoked cases that we see in a year. Of those 459 simple possession of marijuana cases that were brought into the system by law enforcement, our office kicked, killed, null pros, dismissed, whatever you wanna call it, 364 of those. So the vast majority of those cases, if they are even made by law enforcement, are quickly killed by our office. People might be charged with unlawful possession of a controlled substance less than half an ounce and an aggravated robbery, right? But that's a bigger problem. And the aggravated robbery is the bigger issue for the defendant. But the standalone charge of simple possession of marijuana is just not a charge that we see much of in the courts. And when we do see it, we get it out of here by the power of our null pros. Um, so those, a couple of policy decisions and that complete overhaul of the system were already in place. The third thing that was already in place was a new assessment tool for bail. Under the law of the state of Tennessee, pursuant to our constitution, pursuant to Tennessee statutes, bail is required for all cases except a capital case, except a case in which I have said, or my predecessor Bill Gibbons had said, this is a death penalty case. But for every other crime that we have, murder, rape, robbery, defendants are entitled to a bail. And for years and years and years, the pretrial services and the judicial commissioners, the two agencies that work together to decide what bail should be upon arrest, had used Tool A. And now I'm just going to call it Tool A because I'm not even sure it had an official name. But they used an assessment, a list of questions, a process that they followed to determine what the appropriate bail should be in a given case, right? They looked to the facts of the case, they looked to the defendant's record, they looked to the things that the law sets out and articulates must be taken into account before a bail can be set. What is the defendant's record? What is the likelihood that the defendant will return to court? Does the defendant have a history of bench warrants, a history of failures to appear? What are the facts of the case? On and on. And about, I guess, two years ago, the county rolled out a new assessment tool. And this was something that was um, a couple of years in the building, a couple of years in the training for those of us that would be um, using it, seeing it, um, reviewing it to make our decisions. So the clerk's offices, the commissioners, pretrial services, all of those agencies that are on the front line of making those bail decisions. And the new tool is called the PSA, the Public Safety Assessment Tool. And it's one that has been implemented in jurisdictions around the nation. Mark Luttrell, when he was the mayor, uh, contracted with the group that was peddling this tool and brought it here to Shelby County. And so that is the tool that has been in place and was in place before COVID-19. And the reason I bring it up is it's, it's much like when you build a home in a hurricane zone, you make sure that you build that home with all of the precautions that you can to withstand a hurricane. And the PSA tool that Sheriff, or Mayor Luttrell rather, and then Mayor Harris and the commissioners and the pretrial services uh, and the clerk's office were utilizing when COVID-19 hit was designed to make sure that the offenders that were in jail, and jail is used predisposition, right? Jail is used before uh, a case is concluded, to make sure that the people that are in jail waiting on disposition of their case are those that need to be in jail 
waiting on disposition of the case. And that we don't have low level um, individuals with little to no criminal history occupying jail space. So in January of 2020, we had 2,600 people in, uh, in jail at 201 Poplar. In January of 2019, there were 3,000 people sitting in jail uh, at 201 Poplar. So already from 2019 to 2020, we saw that reduction. Today, there's about 1,800 that are sitting in jail, uh, waiting on disposition of their case. And because this tool was in place already, and because of a focus, again, from our office and many others, Public Defender's Office, Defense Bar, um, there is a daily focus on making sure that people that are occupying jail space are the ones that need to be there, the ones that are charged with violent crimes, or those that perhaps are charged with what you might describe as a low level offense, but chances are pretty good that what you might call a low level offense to the victim of that crime means a lot. Victims of businesses who continue to be victims of theft, victims of buildings who continue to be victims of burglary, victims of domestic assault, dom victims of assault. Uh, there are, it's very difficult to find a case in our office that doesn't have a victim attached to it. And so the people that were occupying the jail, even before COVID, uh, we had already begun a concerted system-wide effort to make sure that those that were occupying the space in the jail were those that were charged with serious offenses or those that had proven to us because of their lengthy criminal history that they would continue to reoffend and continue to victimize citizens in our community. The word victim has to be a part of any conversation that we have about the criminal justice system. You cannot talk about making lasting change in our community without recognizing the impact of crime on victims. It's the reason our state constitution has a victim's bill of rights. It's the reason our office fights every day to speak on behalf of victims of crime. And so when we talk about low level offenses, again, um, it's, it's very difficult to identify a crime that doesn't have a victim attached to it. Now, one of the goals every day in our office and, and quite frankly, in any DA's office that I know anywhere in the country, our goal and Rob's goal tomorrow when he gets to court and sees what, what awaits him from a weekend uh, in, in Shelby County, Rob's goal on every case he's gonna to review tomorrow, my goal on every thousands of cases I've reviewed as a career prosecutor, is to do what I can as a prosecutor to make sure this offender never comes back. What can I do as a prosecutor to make sure this offender never comes back to the system? Oftentimes, that is um, dependent upon having services that we can utilize right? The, the, the options that we have as prosecutors, a lot of people think all we do is just send people to prison. All we do is lock people up and send them to prison. Nothing could be further from the truth. We look every day to, for options and resolutions that will keep someone from reoffending. Because if we can accomplish that, that offender is better off, his or her family is better off, his or her community is better off, and we've got one less victim of crime in Shelby County. For a small segment of the population of criminal offenders that we will deal with this week and in the weeks to come and in the months to come, the only choice we have, the only option they have left us with because of the decisions they've made, because of their conduct, because of their actions, is for us to seek prison time because they are violent they continue to harm citizens in our community. And we as prosecutors have a responsibility to public safety. But that class of offenders is the tip of the iceberg. It's a very small segment of the population of offenders that we deal with on any given day. For the bottom of the iceberg, the largest part of that iceberg 
It's a variety of options that we lean on and have leaned on for decades and are creating new ones as recently as just two weeks ago. For the rest of the offenders that we deal with, we lean on drug court. We, are, we have one of the best drug courts in the country here. And the purpose of drug court, the reason that General Gibbons uh, put so much effort into making sure that it got stood up and got stood up right and worked so closely with Judge Dwyer, who has spearheaded this for decades, is because it works. It solves drug addiction. And when the drug addiction is solved, that offender is not going to commit crimes anymore because it was the drug addiction that was driving him or her to commit the crime. When I took office, we stole a page from what was working in drug court, and we've since created a veterans court and a mental health court. Both of these courts are working beautifully to reduce recidivism and to hold offenders accountable at the same time. But when offenders succeed in drug court, veterans court, and mental health court, the most powerful piece of that is that they're held accountable. The victim feels as if she or he has had a voice in the system and a say in the system. And at the end, if they complete it successfully, and it's not easy, no one who's ever been through it will tell you it's easy. But if they do it, their charges are cleared from their record and expunged by our office, and we wipe the slate clean. And so every day, Rob Steele and all of the other fabulous, hardest working individuals in, in government um, look to ways to get that same result. But we can't put everybody into drug court. We can't put everybody into mental health court and veterans court. And so our team has designed alternatives to incarcerations, agencies that we use in town, Hope Works, Lifeline to Success, Memphis Shelby County Office of Reentry. Seedco, Advanced Memphis, Youth Villages, the list goes on and on and on of agencies that we have reached out to who want to be a part of a solution and that we send offenders to. The offender has to want it though. We can't force it. And very often offenders would rather go out to the penal farm and do their time there and get out and not have any strings attached and not have any probation or conditions that they have to satisfy. But taking a page from those alternatives that we've used for decades, we recently announced a community justice program. And this is in many jurisdictions, the same idea is used. It's often called restorative justice. But what we've seen working in kind of a pilot way, we want to fold in the very last page of the program, and that is the community page. And what we hope to accomplish with this community justice panel is sending offenders ages 18 through 26 who are charged with certain misdemeanors, thefts, vandalism, assault that is not domestic violence. Send those offenders to this program. Again, the offender has to agree to go and the victim has to approve it. And by sending them to this program, the case will be reviewed by a community justice panel. Three citizens of the community who have filled out an application on our website and said, I wanna sign up and be a part of this. There's no requirements for being part of these community justice panel and I encourage all of you to sign up for our second wave. We've already had over 60 people sign up to be a part of it. But those panels will listen to the case. They'll listen to the offender talk about why he or she did what they did. They'll hear from the victim. They'll hear how the crime impacted the victim. And then this community panel, who consists of people who live in that community who has been harmed by that crime, will decide what the punishment should be. And they will be given a menu of options of these resources of these agencies, some of which I've described a minute ago, um, to send offenders to, to get off the road of criminal behavior. Because again, that's all we ever want to accomplish with anything and everything that we touch in this office is what can we do to make sure you never come back. So look for more on that. We, uh, we've got a team that's been working very hard on this, helping us uh, get it to the point of announcing it to the public. We've got the applications that have been sent in. We will um, next have to spend a lot of time and energy training the panelists to always remember and uh, honor the victims and, and learn how to respect the victims and 
get a little crash course in the criminal justice program. And then of course, how to best design solutions and resolutions that will restore the community because the community is harmed anytime and every time a crime is committed. Um, Emily, stop there. I've been talking for a long time. Does anybody have any questions about anything so far? Hey, this is Cliff Johnson. I have a question. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Do you know how many of the 1800 people who are currently incarcerated because they can't, they can't, uh, haven't paid bail are there because they can't afford to pay bail? In other words, do you know to what extent ability to pay is considered in making that determination as to where to set the bail? We've, we've litigated bail cases in Mississippi around this issue. And I wonder if you guys are doing a better job than Mississippi in making sure that people aren't stuck in jail simply because they're poor. Well, it's a great question. And so when we talk about bail, remember that we've got a constitution that says you have to set a bail, right? So if it's not a monetary amount, what is it gonna be? What is the substitute for money, right? Um, so that's the system we have. And what the PSA, the tool that I talked about, what it looks to is the offender's criminal record. First, the first place a judicial commissioner is going to look in setting that monetary amount, the first place they're going to look is, can I set an ROR bond? That's always the first question ju judicial commissioners ask themselves because it's what the law requires. The law of the state of Tennessee says you got to look there first. And to make that determination, and I'm just going to read some of the things that are highlighted. Um, do they live in Shelby County? How long have they lived in Shelby County? Uh, and the new PSA tool has kind of a, a grading scale for whether they are a low level offender, a low risk or a high risk offender. And depending on how that assessment tool comes out, the judicial commissioner is going to give and does give great weight to that. So if they are at high risk of reoffending based upon the tool or at high risk of not showing up again because of the tool, then the commissioner is probably going to set the monetary amount a little bit higher. Um, but I completely agree with you that if you've got two people who are exactly similarly situated, which doesn't happen very often, right? Where their criminal histories are identical, the facts of the cases are identical, all things being equal. And again, this doesn't happen very often, if ever. But one of them might have a $10,000 bond set, the other has a $10,000 bond set. And because this offender has access to means, they're able to get out. And this person is not. But until we can finish the sentence with what we replace it with, I don't know what the answer is, right? Um, yeah, and there, and there, of course, there are a lot of non-economic conditions you can put on bail. I mean, I know in the Mississippi system, we have a list of, you know, 15 different possibilities just in our criminal rules and, and then a catch-all that, that allows for non-monetary component to that. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I know you share the same concern. Obviously, all these people are not guilty and, you know, and none of these people being held on bail are guilty yet. And so taking their liberty is a big deal. And, it is, but what our law mandates, and I don't know, I'm not familiar with Mississippi law like you are, but what our law mandates is that you have to balance public safety and is this individual going to get out and reoffend and continue to harm people? And you also have to balance, are they going to return to court? Are they going to come back? And so those are the criteria of that and, and many of the different factors that go into what this public safety assessment tool utilizes. And quite frankly, it's, it's why the jail population had already been reduced pretty drastically before COVID. Um, and everybody is working tirelessly now. But the other thing we're doing is tracking those that have been released since COVID who have reoffended, right? So we've either a judge has 
set an ROR bond because they've listened to some defense attorney make an articulate, articulate, articulate a reason that their client should be released, or you've got a judicial commissioner that is looking at it at the front end, right? Because we're not there. Prosecutors are not there when the bail is set. You've got a commissioner looking at it and saying, um, I'm going to set an ROR bond in this case. Maybe I wouldn't have pre-COVID. I'm setting an ROR bond now. And there is somewhat, uh, and county government is tracking with cooperation with the sheriff's office, those individuals that have been released since COVID who have reoffended. And the list is growing. It's, I think yesterday was 150 plus who have picked up new charges. Um, so yes, it, it's a balancing act, but um, I know some states, the system they have is the monetary bond that is paid is paid into the clerk's office and it goes towards your fines and fees if fines and fees are assessed at the end, right? If you're exonerated of the charges and you're proven innocent, your money's returned to you. But if not, then that money is paid into what you are going to owe toward fines and fees and not paid to a bonding company should you miss court and, and be a flight risk. So, thank you. I won't take up any more time. Appreciate it. No. Any other questions while we're on that topic? Hi, Amy. Jeremy Sykes. Hey. How are you? Hey, great. How are you? Doing well. Um, since you brought up recidivism, um, I wanted to ask about recidivism rates in Shelby County. What are those trends looking like? Um, maybe not year to year, but long term. Um, and then I guess at the same time, what are, what are crime rates looking like? In, in Shelby County. Uh, again, not year to year, but long term. And then the follow up to that is uh, assuming that I'm right, that those those rates are decreasing. What do you tr attribute that to? Thank you. Um, great question. We have, and you're fortunate on this call, I'll answer it and then I'll turn it over to the crime data guru on the screen, Commissioner Gibbons, um, who with the Crime Commission tracks this data, I think every 15 seconds. Um, we are, so our state recidivism rate hovers at about 40%, all right? In Shelby County, we are not that high. And you will hear actually the commissioner, uh, Commissioner Parker talk about the fact that Shelby County pre-COVID um, was doing a much better job at reducing at dropping that recidivism rate, right? And that is the result of a myriad of things, uh, a long list of efforts that have been in place, not just within this office, but throughout the entire criminal justice system. In terms of the crime rate, um, our murder rate is unfortunately through the roof right now. Uh, our record homicide rate was back in 2016 it was 228 homicides. We are on track now to beat that. Um, so violent crime, we're not seeing the trends that we would like to see. We were, um, we had made some pretty good progress and uh, unfortunately some of that has been eroded. There's been some success within various areas of crime since COVID aggravated burglary rates are down. Um, but violent crime, your murder, your rape, your robbery, those crime numbers are going up. And often what historically what has driven our violent crime rate in Shelby County is aggravated assault. Um, An aggravated assault today often leads to a murder next month. But our aggravated assault rate um, has been something that we've struggled with being able to bring down. A couple of years ago, we rolled out a program within this office called Focus Deterrence. Um, there's a book that many of you have probably read called Bleeding Out. And the premise of Bleeding Out is this focus deterrence model. Again, it's not anything that Amy made up. Amy stole it from jurisdictions that have utilized it for a long time. But the idea behind focus deterrence drives at the heart of your question, Jeremy, and in the, at the heart of what we struggle with every day. And that is violent crime and keeping that recidivism rate moving in the right direction. And the premise behind focused deterrence is 
we know who the crime drivers are, right? We know who the crime drivers in this community are. And what you do with focus deterrence is you call them out. And we've done it on three different occasions and we've folded in some domestic violence offenders as well, taking small groups of individuals based upon their criminal history and saying enough is enough. We want you to put the guns down. The community's tired of the violence. And the next time you decide to pick up a gun and hurt someone in this community, either the DA's office or the U.S. Attorney's office is going to do what we can to make sure you don't hurt anybody. But what we'd really like to have happen is that you decide here and now and forever to put the guns down and to stop hurting people. And we then introduce to the room of offenders a whole host of heads of social service agencies of Hope Works, Lifeline to Success, Housing Help, Mental Health Help, Job Training Help, Drug and Alcohol Treatment Help, Child Support Help, whatever obstacle it is that you have in your day-to-day -day life that is contributing to your inability to live within society uh, without committing crimes, here's a whole host of people filling up this room who want to help you. Um, we've done it. It's part of our Operation Safe Community 3 plan. Um, we've done it on a very small scale. Why? When we have such a violent crime problem, because we don't have the resources to do it on a greater scale like we would like to. But we've had some, some good success with it. Um, but we'd love to be in a position to be able to have the resources both within this office and in the other agencies that are part of the criminal justice system, right? Because it's not just the DA's office can't fix it all. Um, we'd love to be in a position to have more resources to be able to expand that program and um, bring that change to, to those violent crime drivers. One of the other issues we deal with in the state and particularly here in Shelby County are our guns. You know, um, a few years ago, our legislature expanded your ability and your right as a homeowner to have a gun in your home they expanded that right to your car. So you can now travel around on the streets of Shelby County and throughout the state, whether you've got a permit or not, whether you've been trained on how to use a gun or not, you can travel around with it in your car. And that has made um, the increase, contributed to the increase in gun crime in our community. It's why Commissioner Gibbons, Director Rawlings drove to Nashville, uh, and testified very passionately about the desire of the legislature to pass open carry. We're having enough struggles here in our community with guns in cars. The last thing that any of us, the director, the Commissioner Gibbons, myself, and several of the rest of us think that is a good thing is for people to be traveling anywhere and everywhere with guns on them because it becomes impossible for law enforcement to know if you are carrying that gun for your protection or are you carrying that gun with an intent to do harm to the citizens of this community? What other questions? Hi, Amy. I, um, I was wondering when you have this room full of all of these experts to help uh, these um, the people that are incarcerated. Uh, if you want to improve, you've got you've got a number of agencies that are willing to help. Do they have grants to um, to assist these people, or is there are is the funds? Uh, is it all? Is it free? Or um, that's what I'd like to know. Yes, it's free for the participants. It's not free for the agencies that are doing it. I mean, but they've all, everybody, when we, when we pitched this idea several years ago and, and got groups in town to sign up to help us, um, mm -hmm. no one came with their hand out. They all said, of course, we're there. And those are many of the same groups that are going to help us and have been helping us with this community justice piece as well. I mean, the, the bottom line is if I can send somebody to Hope Works and they can get trained for a job and get a job and provide for their family and they stop breaking into businesses in our community, everybody wins, right? Mm -hmm. 
but oftentimes the only options that a prosecutor may have, because those aren't agencies that I own, I don't control those agencies. Those agencies have to be willing and able to take on the extra work. Um, but without those agencies and without those proven resources, oftentimes the only choice we may have is let me send somebody to the penal farm and see if they can get the skill training there and get what they need there to be rehabilitated. That's the whole point of our criminal justice system. Um, but the other piece to it that's so important is the offender has to want it. Rob may come up with the greatest offer in the world and work with Leslie Ballin and come up with a settlement that we think is the, the secret sauce to get this career offender on the right path. But if the offender says, I don't want any piece of it and I'd rather go out to the penal farm and do my nine months, that's his or her choice and we can't force him to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I promised I'd talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done since COVID and I'll do that real quickly while if you think of any other questions and then um, I'm sure Commissioner Gibbons or Rob may want to correct some of the misstatements I may have made. Um, when COVID hit, first and foremost, this office has never shut down. We're here every day. The courts have been open every day. What was mandated from the Supreme Court, from Chief Justice Bivens, was that the focus be on individuals in jail. And so day one, the directive from me to the office, to the prosecutors, to anybody and everybody, the directive was who's in jail that we can safely get out of jail who's at the penal farm that we can safely get out of the penal farm, right? And so we have worked and do work every day, very closely with the public defender's office, with the defense bar, um, with the sheriff's office, with the penal farm individuals, with a whole host of agencies. First and foremost, identifying those cases that were on the docket when COVID hit on we use March 13th as kind of ground zero around here, but on March, 13th, um, the communication from me to my office was, if there is somebody on your dockets who is set to plead guilty next Friday, get it on the docket Monday, advance it and move it up to Monday and let's do that so on and so forth. That's so nobody's sitting in jail for the next week waiting on their court date, right? Working with the judges, again, all of this has to be done with the cooperation of the judges. They set their dockets, we don't. Um, but identifying those individuals who had already expressed that they wanted to plead guilty, let's get them out of here if it meant a release from custody. And then every day looking at individuals who are charged with crimes that perhaps to, to Cliff's question, are they in custody on a $500 bond? And if so, why? There might be a good reason why they're in custody on that bond. And it may be that the judge doesn't want to reduce it but we are reviewing those cases as they come in day in and day out. One of the other systems that we've had in place for as long as this office has existed is if an individual is charged with a felony and arraigned in general sessions court and they're guilty of the crime, they wanna plead guilty to that felony and be done with it, they can't enter that plea in general sessions court. They have to go to criminal court to enter that plea. And so we've done that trans or uh, submission rather from general sessions to criminal court through something that's called an information. Well, before COVID, it might be that you said, yeah, I, I broke into the car, I'm caught red handed, I wanna take my time and be done with it. But it could take us weeks, sometimes months to get that case resolved in criminal court. Well, that seems kind of silly. And so when COVID hit, we were able to go to the judges and go to the clerk's office and say, how can we make this move faster? And what used to take weeks and months, we've now gotten down to a day or two. And that's had a great impact. It's been a lot of work on the shoulders of a lot of people in this office, in the clerk's office, and the judges. But it's proven to us that there are inefficiencies that can and should and must be eliminated. Um, because it's not fair to the offender, it's not fair to the victim of the crime, Let's get it off the docket. Let's get this individual out of jail and let's move on. Um, the other big item I wanna make sure I touch on and then I'll open it up to questions, gripes, complaints, and suggestions is truth in sentencing. If you were to ask me if I could wave a magic wand and make one thing happen, 
it would be truth in sentencing. By that I mean if an offender pleads guilty to aggravated burglary today and they are sentenced to three years, they ain't doing three years. They're doing maybe seven months of that time. And it's not fair to victims of crime. It's not fair to offenders of crime to not know exactly how much time someone is going to do. And so it's something that when Commissioner Gibbons worked for Governor Haslam, um, was very much the focus of a task force that he spearheaded. It won't be easy to change our laws to make them truthful as it relates to sentencing. But I think if we accomplish nothing else with this very important conversation about criminal justice reform, people charged with a crime and people who are victims of crime deserve to know exactly how much time an offender is going to get. Let's be honest about it. Um, and let's stop with this kind of magic math that we as prosecutors and, and Rob will have this conversation countless times in the next days and weeks. As a prosecutor, I have never told a victim, this is how much time this person is going to get because we have no way to know. We have no way to calculate. We can guess, but that doesn't seem really fair. Um, so again, that would be something that would, that needs to be part of the conversation and is important to both sides when we talk about criminal justice. Hello, I, I'm Mary Lou McCaw. I just uh, wondered if you would speak to juvenile crime in Shelby County and what uh, efforts are done to try to um, save these children before they end up in adult court. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. When COVID hit, we had, I think, close to 80 juveniles in detention at juvenile court. These are juveniles charged with murder, rape, robbery. These are the worst of the worst. Um, today, or I guess Friday when I left the office, I don't know what the number is right now, the number was 39. So there are 39 juveniles in detention right now, again, charged with murder, rape, robbery. There is much that is done system-wide to help. Is it enough? Probably not. Could more be done? Yes. What happens though is the crime is committed, the violent crime is committed, and it is left to the juvenile court system, the DA's office, to try to piece together what to do now. By the time we are dealing with a juvenile in detention, someone's been murdered, someone's been raped, someone's been robbed um, at gunpoint, and probably many, many people have been robbed by either this juvenile or a group of juveniles. One of the things that we've been doing for the last, I guess, three years now, um, I put a community prosecutor, I put three of my high level senior prosecutors in three different precincts, Old Allen, Tillman and Mount Moriah, to work with the community, in the community and for the community. They're working with law enforcement, yes, but they're also meeting with and listening to principals and business owners and retired citizens who can tell you what drives them crazy about crime in their neighborhood working to build better relationships. Well, shortly after I did that, uh, Judge Michael at juvenile court put a juvenile court probation officer in those precincts. And we've seen great success handling low level juvenile offenses in the community, with the community, for the community, and not having to bring them down to juvenile court to deal with it there. Um, so we've had great luck with that. We'd love to be able to expand it to all nine precincts, but that takes resources that neither the director nor I have at this time. But yes, there's, there's much work that is done. Um, much of it falls on the shoulders of DCS long before there ever is a crime that our office is looking at. But many of these juveniles who are in detention today facing serious time because of serious violent crimes that they committed, yes, many of them have lengthy histories of interaction with the system and opportunities and chances that they were given through DCS and through the courts and through agencies outside of our office to, to get on that right path and to stop 
falling into the habit and the routine of criminal activity. Often it starts with truancy, it escalates to disorderly conduct, it escalates to bringing a weapon to school, breaking into cars, and the next thing we know, we've got a 17-year-old um, charged with a very serious murder. And those decisions that we have to make about transfer are some of the toughest decisions that we make. But if we don't transfer a 17-year-old who's charged with murder, if we don't transfer him or her to adult court, jurisdiction in juvenile court ends when they turn 18, right? And so the time that we have to work with and come up with a resolution that balances victims' rights, that balances public safety, uh, is very, very limited. So the cases that we choose to transfer are few compared to the ones that we could by law ask that a transfer be made. And we hold that and utilize that um, option for really the worst of the worst. But juvenile crime, um, and Commissioner Gibbons can maybe speak to this a little bit, before COVID, we were seeing a very disturbing increase in juvenile violent crime. Any other questions, gripes, complaints, suggestions? Uh, good morning, General. Jake Brown. Hey, Jake. Hey, uh, so I just wanted to speak as um, uh, an attorney who has on occasion been adverse uh, to, to your office or publicly disagreed with some of the decisions, um, in, including uh, recently this weekend. Unfortunately, what uh, none of the interviews have included uh, from me has been the statement uh, repeatedly that although although we don't always agree uh, with your office's decisions, you and members of your office have been extremely professional. Uh, you know, in particular, you you go out of your way to meet with families of uh, victims of officer-involved shootings prior to making a public announcement about the decision, and that's something that frankly, you don't have to do. And um, whether it's it's always clear in the meetings at the time, I, the families do appreciate it. So I just wanted to go on the record as saying that and also say that a, a lot that we've, we've heard from you this morning uh, is encouraging. And so we, we commend your office on, on taking some of those steps to, you know, some, some alternative approaches uh, to the, the prosecutorial role. And thanks for your time and speaking to us this morning. Well, I appreciate that. Um, it's a system and I appreciate your, your comments and I, I say it all the time. Um, I'm blessed to, to work here and to work side by side with Rob Steele and hundreds of others who come to work every day with the job being to do the right thing for the right reason. Not always the easy thing, certainly not always the popular thing. Um, we have very difficult conversations and those, those meetings that I have um, with victims of officer involved shootings are some of the toughest meetings that I have, because as I, as I said to your client on Friday, and I've said it many times, it, it's still a tragic loss of life. No matter what we want to describe it as, or no matter what label we want to give it, it's a tragic loss of life. Uh, and I meet with um, every homicide victim's family in this office. And that was something that Mr. Gibbons did when he was here as well. And those are difficult conversations. And at the end of the day, as I tell them, nothing that we do it's going to ever, ever, ever fix that hole in their heart. Along that line, this is Mary Lou again. Could I just ask one other question following up on that? From just the general public's uh, position, um, when you've got two sides of a story that conflict like this one did uh, about the decision that you all made um, at the end of the week not to uh, that the sheriff's uh, sheriffs would not be prosecuted how is the public supposed to 
understand it or figure out what is the truth um, because we're never going to, there won't be a trial. We're not going to hear the sides presented. And in this case, the stories about what happened, the accounts of what happened are in total opposition to each other. And it's very unsatisfactory from the public's position. Thank you. What I would encourage you to do and anybody else, um, when I took office, we changed how officer-involved shooting cases are handled in Shelby County. And one of the changes that I made was to make the entire investigative file open to the public. And it was very difficult in the beginning to make that happen. What has happened since I started doing it the hard way is the legislature changed the law. And it's now very easy for me and any other DA in the state who wants to. The entire file is on my website. The entire file that my office and my team on officer-involved shootings that I have in place, every word that we looked at is on my website for the entire world to see. And it will remain there for as long as computers exist and the internet is around. So I would encourage you to log on to our website, www.shelbycountydistrictattorneygeneral.com. Um, it's 600 degrees outside, there's nothing else to do. Spend your Sunday reading the file and looking at everything that my team had. Um, what we have to always remember though, is the law, the law of the state of Tennessee. And that is what guides us with every decision we make. Um, Rob can't charge anybody with a theft unless Rob can know in his heart of hearts and in his mind that he can prove his case beyond a reasonable doubt, given the facts, all of the facts, given the law, given any potential defense that might come up, that the most creative defense attorney in the world can come up with. Um, knowing that he can do all of that beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the highest burden uh, in law. So everything, every decision we make is based upon that charging principle and is controlled by the law of the state of Tennessee. But I would um, encourage you to read the file and, and all of the other officer involved shooting cases that we've, that we've had since 2015 are on my website as well. We are uh, bumping up on our time here. Are there any other uh, questions? It's been very, very good. One more question it looks like we have, go ahead. I just hated to have you on um, and not um, just bring up the fact that the church is a member of MICA, the Memphis Interfaith Coalition for Action and Hope. Mm -hmm. And it feels like I'm a huge fan. You prosecuted um, a guy, uh, especially aggr aggravated robbery against my stepdad back in 2005. But I'm sitting in MICA meetings sometimes and it feels like there's a lot of tension between you and your office and Mike, and I wonder if you might speak to that. Um, well, I, is someone from my office in those meetings? I haven't. No, no, no. Okay. That, that, that we're hearing that, um, that you won't follow up with Mike, uh, that there were some requests and some emails about uh, early release data and that kind of thing. It just feels like there's a tension and I'm looking at your face. Maybe you don't feel that way. No, I responded. I sent a letter to Mike. I'll be happy to send you my reply. Um, you talking about the COVID letters? Yeah, no, I did reply. I replied with what I could. Now, a lot of what was contained in the Micah letter and issues that they had and concerns that they had are beyond my, yeah. my control. I can't do anything about, you know, some of the issues that they were concerned about and raising. But um, what I could speak to and what did fall on the shoulders of this office, I did address. I'll be happy to send you a copy of it we got the copy of the letter I think oh, okay. the, the in-person meeting is kind of a sticking point do you feel like you might be open to an in-person meeting with a group from MICA sure and I've, I've I think I've met with them before here you have what? okay okay I mean I, I meet with a lot of people sometimes my memory's not as good as I think but yes yes awesome thanks y'all what a great crowd so in, uh, in closing, 
Um, I am not a lawyer. I know a couple <laughs> of lawyers um, who are on the call. But uh, I thought I had a concept of what your office did and how you go about doing it, but um, I was wrong. So uh, very, very enlightening, very good. And in closing, I'd like to thank you. I think I, I hope I speak for everyone on this call and everyone who lives in Shelby County. We are blessed to have you and Rob and your team uh, doing what you do for us. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Y'all enjoy the rest of your have day. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Be safe.